Rohit ji. Rohit ji. President Pawan Singh ji. Vice President George Abraham ji. Uh, my host here in Washington, Johnson. Sri Ashok Batra ji. Present among us, we have Leela ji, we have Malini ji, we have Agarwal sahab, and all other friends who have gathered here today. I'm very touched at this invitation to speak to you about the life of Rajiv Gandhi uh, on the occasion of his 75th birthday. I'm very touched. Normally, you'd say, oh, I'm honored, or it's a great pleasure for me to be here. But my own emotion is one of uh, gratitude to all of you for giving me this opportunity to share with you my memories of Rajiv Gandhi. We were at school together, but he was three years junior to me. And in a school where you're there only for five years, three years is an entire generation. So I didn't know him at all. But as happens in every school, the juniors know the seniors. So I think it all began with his knowing me, but my not knowing him, only because of our age difference. And so the only memory I have of him at school is that there was a rule which said that the senior boys, that is those who had passed their school leaving certificate, uh, were permitted to swim in the pool at any time of their choice. But juniors, that is those who had not passed their school leaving certificate, could only swim at the designated hours unless they got the permission of a senior to do so. And my memory is of a very shy young boy coming up to me hesitantly rubbing his uh, left ankle with his right toe and saying in the language that was there in the school, Yaar, give us permission to swim, Yaar. The usual senior reaction was to say, get out. Fortunately, I didn't. I said, yes, of course, and worked my way, therefore, into the prime minister's office. That was the beginning of a relationship that I didn't think would have any future. Then when I was at Cambridge, I ran for president of the union. And many, many years later, 20 years later, I learned that Rajiv had gone among the Indian students saying, look, there's an Indian running for president of the union. And the least you fellows can do is to go and vote for him. So Rajiv began his political career by canvassing for me. So I think it is appropriate that I should end mine by canvassing for him. He was, it was in the absence of knowing him that I found myself invited to join the Prime Minister's office from the Foreign Service. There are always Foreign Service officers who work with the Prime Minister, but I was put in this strange position of not being asked to deal with foreign affairs, because there were others uh, who were dealing with foreign affairs. And I was given a curious miscellany of jobs, one of which was to organize his tours in India. And I grabbed the opportunity with both hands, because I knew that he was interested in going all around the country, especially to remote places, especially to places that I would otherwise not be able to get to. And uh, that here was the opportunity to do a real Bharat Darshan. And it was only incidentally that I was doing it in the company of the Prime Minister. But because we spent several days on the road, uh, I ended up spending rather more time with him than other officials of the Prime Minister's office. And I grew to admire him. I grew to admire him, I say, because I went to vote against the Congress in the December 1984 election. Because I was very upset with uh, 
the riots that had taken place, the pogrom that had taken place against the Sikhs in Delhi in the immediate aftermath of his taking over. And although I didn't think he was personally to blame, I did feel that the Congress had let the country down and let down our duty to protect our minorities at that stage. Happily for me, my name was not on the voting list. So I cannot have the sin attributed to me of having voted against the Congress party. But it was in those circumstances that I was inducted into the PMO. And over the next five years, I grew to immensely admire this man. Because I came in not because I was an admirer of either his or the Congress, but as a skeptic. And that skepticism was removed by the kind of actions I saw and the ideas that animated those actions over the next five years. To begin with, the bane of Indian democracy at that stage was what were called the Ayarams and the Gayarams. Those who would get elected on one party ticket and then usually for extremely uh, despicable reasons, money, power, they would switch sides. And we have the classic example of Haryana going fully, everyone there, in favor of the Janta Dal. And the day the election took place, the chief minister arrived at Willingham Crescent with all the members of the Haryana Assembly saying they'd switch sides to the Congress. So while it had benefited us, Rahul Rajiv's first step in terms of legislation was bringing in the Anti-Defection Act and putting it in the 10th schedule of the Constitution, which would prevent the act from being challenged any, in any court. And that has remained with us for the last 10 years. And although we've seen recent examples of people defecting in order to bring down our government and bring in other governments, the fact of the matter is that they lose their seats and can only hope to be able to recover them when the next election takes place. And very often, the receiving party's legislators are annoyed at the induction of the defecting MLA because he will be asking for a seat and somebody who has won the seat might find himself thrown out in order to accommodate a defector. So this disease of Indian democracy was removed by Rajiv Gandhi within a week or so of his becoming the prime minister with an electoral majority, the largest majority that any prime minister in India has ever known. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Modi is one day going to describe himself as the prime minister with the largest majority. The fact is that he has about 120 seats less than Rajiv Gandhi had in 1984. So he used that majority for this purpose. He also used the opportunity he had got to tackle the problems of the country which had accumulated at a time when he was not even in politics, he was a pilot with Indian Airlines, and then had found himself, owing to the sudden accidental death of his brother, catapulted into politics. And yet, he had in his mind ideas on how to solve our problems. So, I happened to be with him when, ignoring security considerations, he actually went to Punjab in May, in March of 1985. It was a, Punjab at that stage was a no-go territory. And the Khalistanis were clearly dominant, but dominant with the gun. And they had also in their left hand, so to speak, the right hand had the gun, the left hand had the Gurgurat And in the name of religion, there was 
massacres going on in in Punjab to a point where I think it would be reasonable to say that the temper in Punjab at that stage was approximately what the temper is in Kashmir today. But instead of taking measures that would uh, impose the will of Delhi on Chandigarh, impose the will of Delhi on Amritsar, he said, let us take the rebels along. So his first appearance in Punjab at Husseiniwada in March 1985 was designed to signal that I am not <coughs> against the Punjabis. I am not against the Sikhs. I want to hear from you what is it that is troubling you. And the consequence was that Sant Longowad entered into an agreement which brought the Punjab crisis to an end. It was after the political steps were taken that KPS Gill was inducted to undertake uh, anti-terrorist operations against those who were out to kill him. And he, this business of going into Punjab as the Prime Minister of India and that too within four months of the rioting in Delhi, I would call it the pogrom in Delhi, in which thousands of Sikhs had been killed, was the prior chit. It was the demonstration, like his mother's demonstration, that if the Sikhs are upset with me because of Operation Blue Star, I will not agree, she said, to the Sikh guard being removed from my personal security. And it was Sikh guards, her Sikh guards. And I heard Rahul talking about how he had been playing badminton with them just two days before the assassination took place, who killed her. She, in a sense, was killed by her own goodwill towards the community. And Raji, following that example, reached out by going to Husseiniwada and then appointing Arjun Singh as the governor of uh, Punjab in order to facilitate negotiations between them. And one of the, Arjun Singh's biography says this, that one of the conditions he laid down when he became the governor of Punjab was he told his security that any Khalistani whom I call to meet here will not be body searched by the security before he comes in to see me. And this was the way in which a signal was given that you may have your differences with us, but we believe that we should talk to you and that when we talk to you, we shall do it by giving you your dignity, your honor, your identity. So you come in, if you betray us by picking up a pistol and shooting me dead, well, that will be on your conscience. But as far as we are concerned, we have to demonstrate that we trust you, that we regard you as one of us. Is this not the lesson that we should be learning for dealing with Kashmiris who are upset with us? Can we have the territory of Kashmir without the people of Kashmir? And if the people of Kashmir are with us, as the government is claiming, then why don't you leave them free to carry Ajit Doval on their shoulders and say what a great man he is? Why don't you let them out to put up posters saying Modi Zindabad, Amit Shah Zindabad? Why is it necessary to convert an entire Riyasat into an open prison? Why is it necessary to cut Kashmiri off from Kashmiri from every mohalla in Srinagar being cut off from the next mohalla? Why is it necessary to pick up 4,000 Kashmiri leaders, not just political leaders, not just religious leaders who might be involved in politics, 
not just social leaders, but anyone who has the potential to speak on behalf of the Kashmiri people and express the joy that is flooding Kashmir because Article 370 has been removed and a wonderful paradise is going to open up there. This is what they claim and yet this is not what they do because they know that the people of Kashmir who were about 25% with us until the 4th of August are now 100% against us after the 5th of August. So when you look at the way in which Rajiv tackled the Punjab situation and he was able to create a Punjab Accord by July of 1985, that is just seven months after the people of India gave him the mandate to sort out this issue. Tragically, Sant Logoal was assassinated. But Rajiv was able to create an atmosphere of trust in which by the time his term ended, 47% of the police stations in Punjab were freed of any kind of terrorism. And very soon after, it died. And the fact that you have today, as the Indian Overseas Congress president, a man who proudly wears a turban on behalf of the Congress is proof of the fact that you win over people not by killing them, you win them over <laughs> by reaching out to them. And then the astonishing thing, the other problem that is still running, it's still there in Assam as to what the Assamese should do about preserving their identity, their culture, in a situation where they are overrun by Bengali-speaking people who come both, who are number one, indigenous to Assam, number two, who have migrated there for economic opportunity over several generations from what you may call West Bengal, or Bengal as it was, as an integrated province, before partition. And then some came in after partition. Rajiv, they were led by young students, boys who would be like some of the young men I've, from Kerala that I've been introduced to today. They were no older than that. <coughs> And the Prime Minister of India sat down with him. R.D. Pradhan tells the amusing story, that was the Home Secretary, that after he had negotiated the settlement, he presented the document to Rajiv Gandhi, who immediately pulled out his pen to correct the English. And Pradhan said to him, sir, you cannot change a comma. Because if in the interest of correct grammar, you unravel the whole agreement, then we'll have to start again. They agreed to all these phrases, whatever your dual school English may have taught you, not a comma, not a semicolon. They're waiting for you, just come inside. And at about two o'clock in the morning, it's the middle of the night, with him going on the ramparts of the Red Fort, a few hours later, the Assam Accord was signed. And the political basis of the Assam Accord was that we will have an election, although there is a Congress government in power. And as a result of this Assam Accord, it is the opposition to the Congress that will win that election. And I remember going with Rajiv at the time that the elections took place. And one of those in our plane was Amitabh Bachchan. And it was thought that if you can produce Amitabh Bachchan on the stage, then automatically people will, will be swooning because he's there. And he got a very bad reception. And the Congress was hopelessly defeated. 
But India won. India won. Because these people, the AGP, came into office, they couldn't agree among themselves for longer than one or two years. Bhrigu Pokan fell out with Professor Mahanto. Another election came, and Saikya was re-elected as the Chief Minister of Assam. This is the same Saikya who had become Chief Minister after the massacre at Nelly. The same man. But because Rajiv was ready to sacrifice the Congress in order to save India, we were able, very shortly thereafter, to have Mr. Saikya become the Chief Minister once again. And there were more foreigners detected by the tribunals and sent out of Assam after, when, after the Congress government came into power than when the AGP government. Contrasted with what is happening today, there's a massive exercise that's never happened in world history before that every Assamese is being asked to prove that he's an Indian. He's not being spotted for not being an Indian. He's being asked to prove that he's an Indian. And the proof consists of bureaucrats looking at documents in a state which, like the other states of India, has a large number of people, very large number of people, who are not functionally literate, and certainly not functionally literate in the languages in which birth certificates are prepared or land records are given. And they ask to prove that they've been here since before a, date in, a cutoff date in March 1971. And the result was that we first got some 40 lakh Assamese being told that, no, you're not on the National Register of Citizens. Then a process was initiated by the Supreme Court, which said that you just recheck all of this. And we've got a very curious position in India today, where the number of Assamese who are being put onto the, who were kept out of the National Register of Citizens, has come down by half to just under two million. But a huge percentage of those are Hindus. And therefore, who is objecting today to the NRC is the BJP government with Mr. Uh, Bishwal uh, Sharma, the Congress defector, who defected from the Congress because the Congress would only make him Deputy Chief Minister into the BJP, who have said that we will not make you anything more than the Deputy Chief Minister. So I don't know what he's gained personally by this great act of betrayal, this Judas-like act. But I'm not much concerned with Mr. Bishwa's personal problems. What I do see is the BJP, including Mr. Sonowal, the Chief Minister of Assam, are now saying there's something wrong with this process because how can so many Hindus be illegal immigrants and so few Muslims be illegal immigrants? And this in a situation where the Prime Minister has announced that there is a right of return for Hindus, like there's a right of return for Jews in Zionist Israel. Our Citizenship Act did not talk about a person's religion when it was dealing with doubtful cases of citizenship. If, you, if the state could prove that you are not an Indian citizen, that was a separate matter. But you were not asked to establish that you are an Indian citizen before being recognized under the Citizenship Act. And the Citizenship Act was primarily involved with certifying the Indian citizenship of immigrants who had legally come into the country or who could claim that they were, un they were citizens of India under the law of the country. That's the normal legal procedure. They were not being discriminated against because they were immigrants and they were not being discriminated against 
on the basis of religion. And now we have a situation where instead of simply saying that Hindus can come in, they've added Buddhists and Christians and Parsis. I'm not sure how many Parsis are coming into India at a time when almost all Parsis are going out and going to Canada. We've also had a regrettable situation where the Jews of Kerala, who were the only Jewish community in history who have never been discriminated against, decided because of the good luck, life, to go to Israel for many of the kind of professional and monetary reasons for which you have decided to come to America. So it's not an issue of religion. And yet the Citizenship Act is being amended to specify that if you are a Hindu, you have an automatic right of return. So these Hindus who have been identified as illegal immigrants are going to eventually have the right to live in India because they're Hindu, which essentially means that the NRC is designed to get the Muslims out. It has no other objective. It has no other objective. And is this the India that we want? Contrasted with Rajiv Gandhi telling them, please take over the government and run it in your own interest. And we will do the following thing. What was there in that Assam agreement, apart from setting up these tribunals? It said, you can have an IIT, you can have an oil refinery. What else was in the agreement? So these are matters of development that can easily take place, irrespective of whether there are too many Bengalis in Assam or not. But he said, whatever you want, I give it to you. But stop your agitation against India. Don't make it an issue of language or culture. Make it an issue of citizenship as to whether you came in without any papers before 1971. And if you come in after 1971, have you any papers? And it's for the state to prove that you don't have the papers not for you to establish that you do have the papers. And we've had a completely peaceful Assam since then. It's now that the place is going up in flames. And then the utterly brilliant settlement on Mizoram. And Mizoram is so far away from the rest of us that I would imagine that almost nobody in this audience has been to Mizoram or even thought of going to Mizoram. But Mizoram is the place where we had a 20-year insurgency. It was an armed insurgency. Mizoram is on the border of East Pakistan, as it then was. And therefore, they were getting assistance from the Pakistanis to continue running this uh, insurgency. And the insurgency was led by a very brave man who had the respect of the Mizo people called Laldenga. The Congress Party, on the other hand, had the longest living Congress president ever. Mr. Laltan Hola became the president of the Congress in 1973, and he's still in 1917, 2019, the president of the Congress. He's longer lived than Mohan Singh. This man, Lal Tanhola, had got himself elected as the chief minister of Mizora. And when Rajiv's emissaries negotiated the deal with Lal Denga, he said, how do I know that after I've laid down arms, I'll be rehabilitated politically in Mizora within India? And Rajiv said, I have the answer. I'll tell my chief minister to resign. And the leader of the insurgency will be made the chief minister of Mizoram. And his deputy will be Lal Hola, who for the previous 
20 years or so, had been the prime target for assassination by his own chief minister. This is how you demonstrate faith and trust and bring them in because you're bringing them in with their hearts. You're not dragging them in against their will. Contrast this with how the insurgency in Nagaland is being handled. Five years ago, there was a newspaper writer that there was a Naga agreement that what the Congress had failed to do for all those years, that Mr. Modi had done the miracle, done a Rajiv Gandhi of establishing an agreement with the Nagas. That agreement is being seen only by the civil servants who are involved in drafting it. Mr. Modi, he hasn't yet revealed it to the country. And it's five years since he claimed that he has brought peace to Nagaland. Now there in Nagaland, he's negotiating with people who have a gun. Here in Pakistan, he says terror and talks can't go together. There, terror and talks can go together. And an agreement can be signed. And the agreement, having been signed, is kept a secret. Now, what kind of inconsistency is this? When you contrast the statesmanship that was shown by Rajiv with what was happening here, you come to realize that you don't have to be many years in politics. You just have to be an intelligent and good man with the right values and the right vision for the country to be able to sort out within 18 months Punjab, Assam, Mizoram. Kindly show me what is the extent to which there has been any kind of settlement of uh, difficult issues in the six years of Mr. Modi. He's had six years to do it. Then he decided that he would give full statehood to Mizoram. This was after another election, La Lenga fell. He and his friend, Brigadier Silo, who was running the other political party, non-Congress political party in Mizoram, they had a falling out between themselves and so that government fell. A fresh election was held and the Congress won that election. And when the Congress won that election, what did Mr. Laldinga do? He didn't pick up a gun. He just went across the aisle and became the leader of the opposition. And Brigadier Silo, who had learned how to use a gun with the Indian Army, and had been promoted to the rank of brigadier, so he was not a junior non-commissioned officer. He was a senior member of the Indian Armed Forces. He was expressing his dissent from the Congress by consistently standing against the Congress. Was he shut up in a jail with the Home Minister saying, in the house that Mr. Abdullah is not under arrest. If he's not in the house, it's of his own will. Then he's saying, no, no, he ain't under arrest, but he has been put in a palace. So he is very comfortable in the palace in which he is. And today, six weeks later, saying that it's not enough that he's been put in great comfort in a palace. We're arresting him under the Public Safety Act, where he can be held for two years without being brought to trial. Contrast that with the treatment given to Brigadier Silo and to Laldenga after their defeat. That's how you bring about reconciliation. You can't put every friend of India into prison incommunicado and hope to win the hearts of the people of Kashmir. If 4,000 social leaders, religious leaders, political leaders, including people who've been friends of India in the most difficult circumstances in Kashmir, 
if you put them into jail and say you're going to create a new cadre, so marvelous, who's stopping you from creating a new cadre? He says, oh, we finished the Abdullah family. So who are you to finish the Abdullah family? Leave that to the Kashmiris to do. If as many Kashmiris say they don't like the Abdullah family, the Sheikh Abdullah should not have taken Kashmir into India at all. Well, leave it to the people of Kashmir. How can a joint secretary in the Home Ministry or an IAS officer sitting as the commissioner of Srinagar decide that no, we now have a Congress Mukt Bharat and we're going to have a National Conference Mukt Kashmir. Mukti. And then there's Mufti. They were in alliance with them to form the government. They had an alliance, they had an agreement on alliance, AOA. It specified that they would reach out to the people of, or to the members of the Huria in order to sort things out. And when I went to Mr. Goswami's uh, thorough disapproval to Kashmir and met with Gilani, it's amazing. I was at the governor's house for lunch just before I went to see Gilani, and the governor, Mr. Vora, said to me, oh, you're going to see Mr. Gilani. Just tell him that it was his sermon that brought the stone pelting to an end last year, and would he please make an appeal to these youngsters who are now protesting. I was asked to carry this message by the governor of Jammu Kashmir to Mr. Gilani. I did. And he said to me, well, then I was a free man. Now I'm under arrest. So let me out and I'll make the appeal. And that Delhi was not willing to do. And then I got a message from the chief minister's house that I should go and see her. So I went with my colleagues. And she said, you're doing the work that we ought to be doing. And I came out and told my delegation that none of you, this has been said to us in confidence, none of you is to meet any member of the media and tell them. The next morning I found that it was all in the papers in consequence of a press communique issued by the chief minister's office and put onto the front pages. She was so desperate that she was being prevented from reaching out to people inside Kashmir in a government that she was jointly running with the BJP. So now they've come to the conclusion that Mr. Satpal Malik, the well-known Kashmiri Mufti, you know, he's been there all his life. He, has, he understands the Kashmiri psyche like nobody else does. His background is that of a UP wala who has defected so often that he's been in every party that I can think of in Northern India. He was in the Congress. He was a Congress MP in the Rajya Sabha. And uh, we had to throw him out for under the Anti-Defection Act. This man, who knows nothing about the place, is the one who is now the voice of the people of Kashmir. It is on his say-so that uh, the agreement of the people of Kashmir has been secured to uh, de-operationalizing Article 370. And what kind of a farcical democracy is this? And contrast it with what Rajiv was doing. Then Rajiv goes to Sri Lanka. His life is in danger. And he accepts the request made by Jayawardhane to please send in the Indian peacekeeping force, not the Indian army a peacekeeping force to act as a buffer between the Sri Lankan army and the LTTE. They haven't come there to attack the LTTE. They've come to save the LTTE in order to enable the Sri Lankan army to shift its focus to southwest Sri Lanka, where this uh, insurgent called Rohan had restarted a major rebellion. It's at their request that the IPKF goes in. 
And today, what the IPKF did when they were there is being denigrated as the foolishness of this man. But how do you get the trust of a neighbor unless you help him in his worst moment? Jayavardhani was no, was no friend of India's. One day when I, I referred to him in favorable terms, Rajiv smiled at me and said, do you know why he's called the old fox? He said he's a totally untrustworthy man. But he is the prime minister. Actually, he was the president of uh, Sri Lanka. And we have to deal with what we have over there. When the Maldives had a military coup against the elected government, Rajiv was sitting in Harare. I can't think of a further point in the globe not geographically, but in spirit, than Harare from the Maldives. And within hours of arriving there, he had arranged a show of demonstration by the Indian Air Force and by the Indian Navy, which restored democracy to Maldives. And when he came to Pakistan, he repeatedly met Ziaul Haq. Repeatedly. He met Zia al -Haq. They talked among each other. There was, we had just returned from Rajiv's vacation in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And I had asked him to come to Bangalore where I'd organized something for him. And so I flew back with him from Bangalore. Next morning when I went into his office, he looked at me and said, you know, Mani, we're almost at war with Pakistan. I said, hey, war with Pakistan? Why? He said, well, while I've been away, Sundarji, who's the chief of army staff, and Arun Singh, who had been his best friend and was the Minister of State for Defense, they have ratcheted up tension between India and Pakistan to the point that we are now almost at war. And in order to defuse that situation, I have to talk to Zia al -Haq. He said, how can I meet him? Have you any suggestions? So since I had been in Pakistan as India's Consul General from 1978 to 82, and had been there while Zia al was the president, I said to him, sir, you can't ask him to come to Delhi because he's already been to Delhi five times and you haven't been to Pakistan once. I said, therefore, try and invite him as a second option to Amritsar. And if he's not able to accept that, then maybe you can agree to going to Lahore, but don't go to Islamabad because that will not be properly understood. So Rajiv said to me, just wait where you are, be at the telephone, I'm going to Parliament House, and I'll call you back in a few minutes. And five minutes later, my telephone rang. It was Rajiv on the line, saying, I've talked to Zia, and he's agreed to come to Delhi. The first option that I had myself ruled out. And he talked to him. And now, what happened at the time of Operation Brass Tax has gone out of the memory of everybody. Because when tensions rise, what a prime minister should be doing is not aggravating the tension, should not be creating a warlike situation. He should be trying to defuse the situation and arrive at a political settlement, one that neither side gives up anything. And he loved quoting the Buddha, who said the only victory is one in which there are no victors. He cited that in the United Nations. You cannot win by humiliating your opponent. You cannot defeat him. You can bring him to your side. And if you try and do that, then you're going along the Gandhian path. That's what he demonstrated. And when Zia died in that air accident, then Rajiv went to the Sark conference in Islamabad. It was in December 1988. 
and he did a little trick. I can't claim any responsibility for the little trick because that was pure Rajiv Gandhi. He was the only one, only prime minister to not pay a tribute to Ziaul Haq for having managed Sa over the previous two years. And Benazir was so thrilled that he hadn't mentioned Ziaul Haq that she begged him to stay on beyond the scheduled hour of departure by two hours in order to be able to claim <coughs> that the Indian Prime Minister had made the first bilateral visit to Pakistan in, at that stage, 28 years. Nehru had gone in 1960. Indira Gandhi never went. Lal Bahadur didn't go. Rajiv went. Even Muradi Desai didn't go. Rajiv went and he listened to this and he smiled and said, okay, I'll stay on for another two or three hours. And then they agreed that he would go back once again for a proper visit. It was also in December 88 that he broke a 26-year-old taboo. After the 1962 incident, I'm not going to call it a war, I'm not going to call it an invasion, but the armed conflict of 1962 no Indian Prime Minister, not even Atil Bihari Vajpayee, who had gone to China as Foreign Minister, had the guts to go to China. Rajiv went. Rajiv went, I happened to be with him. And in the Great Hall of the People, which has a circular dome and therefore has a circular shape, <coughs> Deng Xiaoping took Rajiv's hand and almost waltzed around the Great Hall of the People, giving every camera in the world, all of which were located in the galleries above them, the opportunity of focusing on an Indian hand shaking with a Chinese hand. I would say that was the only achievement of that visit only concrete achievement in the visit. The rest of it was the initiation of a process. We had 18 rounds of talks on the border between India and China. We haven't come to a solution. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes to 80 rounds. But because it's talk, because it's jaw-jaw, it's not war-war. We were even able to overcome the Doklam war by in a peaceful manner. There is an agreement which is called an agreement on peace and tranquility at the border, uh, which is negotiated in 1994 by Pradha Pradha Mukherjee. It's lasted. It's lasted all these years. And China defeated us. The Pakistanis have never defeated us. And they never will be able to. But, they, and they know it, what is more. But we don't talk to Pakistan. We talk to the Chinese. Why this contradiction? Why this contradiction? This is so much easier to bully smaller people and to come out a hero. But history tells us that there's many Rustams and many Shorabs and many Davids and many Goliaths. We should be working towards some kind of an understanding not repeating these slogans of talks and terror can't go together. We must do what Dr. Manmohan said, and I'm sorry, he's not, Rajiv is not there, but Dr. Manmohan Singh and Musharraf held a series of meetings or organized it on the back channel, and the result was Musharraf's four point program, which is acceptable to all Kashmiris and can constitute a basis for settling issues between India and Pakistan. But has Prime Minister Modi ever mentioned these? And how did that come about? How did we reach the point of the program? It was because Rajiv made 
another state visit, a proper official visit to Pakistan, to Islamabad, in July of 1989. So as Prime Minister, he went to Pakistan three times, where no Indian Prime Minister had gone to Pakistan since Nehru's visit in 1960. 28 years. It broke some mold. It broke a mold which enabled India and Pakistan to talk when Kashmir was burning. Salman Haider was the Indian Foreign Secretary. Sattar, who was the toughest Pakistani diplomat in my long life in politics, in diplomacy, I've ever come across. Sattar and Salman entered into an agreement in 1997 where they said that these are the topics that will be discussed. It was called the Composite Dialogue. And all that Sushma Swaraj has been able to do is to change the name of the composite dialogue to the comprehensive dialogue. And with that, she's passed away. That is the only legacy she has. And we are today in a state of such heightened tension with Pakistan that if you don't trust the Pakistanis, you're putting yourself in the path of a nuclear bomb. If you do trust the Pakistanis like I do, I don't think they, they're so stupid as to actually use a nuclear bomb. But you have to be engaged with them for the nuclear bomb to not be used. If it was possible for Vajpayee, I'm not even talking about Congress Prime Minister, to Vajpayee, who had been betrayed by Musharraf, the butcher of Kargil, to receive Musharraf in Agra, after the parliament attack and Operation Parikrama, it was possible for him to do that, to hold an unsuccessful summit with Musharraf and follow it up by going to Islamabad in January 2004 and signing an agreement which put a process in motion, a process which Manmohan Singh took advantage of to create a four-point program then surely we who have the guts to do a surgical strike on Pakistan should have the guts to sit across a table with the Pakistanis. What's the great problem? Why can't we talk to them? And if you don't talk to them, then the rifle is the answer. But if you use the rifle, they may use the nuclear bomb. And you can, of course, use the nuclear bomb too. But we'll have a total wasteland where today one and a half billion people live. Is that what you want? You have the satisfaction of destroying Pakistan and the dissatisfaction of destroying India. The nuclear bomb is a real thing. It's not meant to be used. It's meant to deter. The Shimla Agreement says Kashmir will not be settled by any international intervention, but strictly on a bilateral basis. And we are now going to see a spectacle of fireworks in New York on the 27th, when Imran takes the stage, and then you have Zion, uh, sorry, Imran, uh, when Modi taking the stage. And we'll have excellent rhetoric and there'll be memorable phrases. But do you think Kashmir is going to be sorted out in the United Nations? It won't. So we have to realize that, as Rajiv did, that you can go to China, you can go to Pakistan, you can try and deal with international crises in the same way as you deal with domestic <coughs> crises and neighborhood crises. So when you put down a record of Punjab, Assam, Mizoram, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Pakistan, China. What is this man to say? That I hugged, Mo I hugged uh, Trump? And if we hugged him for eight and a half minutes, then Trump would not be going to Houston. 
So this is no way of conducting foreign policy because foreign policy is not event management. I wrote some years ago that other countries have a PM, we have an EM, an events manager. What is the point of having a prime minister who is washing the dirty linen of India, first in Madison Square, then in San Francisco, then in Houston, he's done it in, in Toronto, he's done it in Tokyo, he's done it in Sydney. Why does he want to defame India? Why does he want to defame everything that India did? Why does he never mention that the Korean War would not have come to an end without the neutral nation's peacekeeping force that was commanded by General Timaya? He never mentions that, that peace could not come to Indochina without Krishna Menon sitting in the Hotel Beau Rivage in Geneva. And Pierre Mondes France said of the Indochina conference that there were nine participants around the negotiating table in the Palais des Nations. And then there was a tenth participant, Krishna Menon, India, which was principally responsible, so responsible for bringing about the Indochina Accords that India was made the chairman of the, new, of the International Supervisory and Control Commissions in the three countries of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. That was the India that was respected. It was an India which was regarded as the moral guide of the world. It was the India that reflected in its external policy the philosophy of nonviolence that Gandhi had proved was a viable political instrument. Yes, I give the credit to Jesus Christ, who said, turn the other cheek. But the one who translated an ethical principle into, a, into practical politics was Mahatma Gandhi. And his favorite disciple, Jawaharlal Nehru, decided to base our foreign policy on those ethical principles. The result was, that where there was only one member nation of the United Nations in 1947 to be a non-aligned country, we were absolutely at low at that stage. By 1983, when the summit took place in Delhi, of which I was the chief conference spokesman, we had two-thirds of the nations of the world and half the population represented. That was real achievement in foreign policy. And Rajiv took that message forward. The action plan on universal disarmament that he presented to the United Nations on the 9th of June 1988 is the only plan presented by anybody at the prime ministerial level, which in practical step-by-step -step terms sets out how we can be a nuclear-free world. Nobody has done it. Nobody has surpassed it. He was received here in Washington three times. There isn't a country in the world where he wasn't welcomed. There's nothing new about an Indian prime minister being well-received abroad. Indian Prime Ministers are well received abroad because they are Indian Prime Ministers, not because their name happens to be Narendra Modi. When Narendra Modi was not the Prime Minister of India, the United States of America refused for 10 years to give him a visa to come here. He couldn't go to any Western democracy. So you can't attribute all this to the personality and uh, the charm of this man, that is the moment. It's India that is being respected. It is the contribution that all of you are making to American prosperity that is taking Trump to Houston. It is because he needs your votes, not Mr. Modi's vote, that he's going to Houston. And yet, 
all the credit is being garnered by one man, as if that's where all virtue resides. So I think we should beware. We should remember Rajiv Gandhi principally because I've been signaled to stop. We should honor Rajiv Gandhi principally for four reasons. Four reasons that are not topical, that don't relate to his period in office, but which determine what Rohit was describing as the idea of India. First and foremost, democracy. It was Jawaharlal Nehru, not Narendra Modi, who made India the only country which has attained liberation since 1947. And there are approximately 150 such nations. To have become a democracy and remain a democracy for all these years, even if that democracy has disraced itself by electing this mini Hitler as the Prime Minister of India twice over. And Rajiv said, this is a representative democracy. But it's a very, it's, a, it's the world's least representative democracy. And what in a country like India we need is participatory democracy to supplement representative democracy. And so Panchayati Raj, does anyone know in this audience and I'd like to know why the Congress party, why the Overseas Congress is not propagating this, that with 32 lakh elected representatives in our panchayat, of whom 14 lakh are women, we have, yeah, I'll just finish in a minute. I, I think they've had their dinner. So I think Rajiv Mahathir is now. Just give me a few more minutes. <laughs> Sum it up as quickly as I can. To make this democracy at the grassroots a reality, we have 14 lakh women <coughs> elected to our panchayats. There are more elected women in India alone than in the rest of the world put together. And you don't know it. <laughs> There are one and a half lakh scheduled caste presidents in the panchayats in India. There are 86,000 women who are running the panchayats in India. And most of these women come from the lower caste and the lower income groups. Again and again, the rich upper class rural woman has not been voted for because they say we can't come into your house and when we come into your house you're sitting in Chandigarh anyway. But if we have a poor woman of a low caste, she remains in the village. So we go to her, if the taps don't run water and the drain doesn't drain out water and we knock on her door and we say, Benji, sister, if you don't get my tap operational within the next 24 hours, you're not going to get my vote next time. This is the reality of India. And it is this that is being perverted by Modi in Kashmir to say that he's going to make it a national conference in a Mehbubha Mukti, a Mufti Mukt uh, Kashmir by getting people who've been elected in some cases with two votes in the whole village.